Um, if you look just past me, there's a dumpster up there. And I was intrigued this morning. I was praying for the service, and, and a guy comes out from the fire hall with a big garbage can. <clears throat> he wheels it down to the dumpster. And uh, I thought, no big deal. I mean, this is pretty routine. Until he stopped at the dumpster, and he paused, went over to the front, had to unlock it, unlatch it, and then get the dumpster open so that he could dump the garbage in there. I thought, that's quite a routine. I understand why, so people don't come by with their own trash and fill the dumpster. That's the fire hall's dumpster, all right? So he goes back, gets more trash, puts it in the dumpster, and then has to undo the whole thing, and I mean, the process, puts the latch back over, locks the, the thing, so that nobody else can get in. Now, I'm sitting there thinking, I guess I know where not to bring my trash. That's pretty elaborate, locking system on that dumpster. But my second thought was, I'm really glad that I don't have to somehow appeal to God to unlock his dumpster. You know, that nobody can come and dump. That's an amazing thing. When Jesus died, he died so that basically, I know it's kind of a crass analogy, so that everybody can use his dumpster. Isn't that an amazing thing? When Jesus died on the cross, he made it possible. He basically unlatched the dumpster so that all of our sins and all of our trash and all of our garbage can be dumped readily in his dumpster. Now, if you want to take the analogy a little further, and I'm sure some of you uh, may go, have see this on the horizon, but there is something to unlocking the dumpster, and that is repentance. You know, it's not like the garbage just disappears. You have to take it to the dumpster. And that's a process we call confession or repentance. It's the idea of bringing our trash to the dumpster, and then he takes care of it for us. He has died that our sins might be forgiven. And so we have that time at the beginning of the service where you can take out the trash. You can take it to his dumpster, to the foot of the cross, and he is, as the scripture says, faithful and just. He forgives your sins. You will never see that trash again. That's a wonderful thing uh, that we have in our, our culture is the idea of dumping the trash and not ever seeing it again, knowing that it is gone. The problem is it's in some landfill somewhere. But with God, it disappears completely. You will never find those sins again. The trash is absolutely gone. So let's do that now. Let's go to the foot of the cross and take our trash, our sins, our failures to him. Dear Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful that we can come to you, that we know without a shadow of a doubt that when we repent of our sins, the dumpster is there for all who come to you in faith. And we can take our trash and know that it is forever gone. And so we do that now. We bring our sins and failures to you. Dear Heavenly Father, your word has promised that when we confess our sins to you, when we humble ourselves and come to you in brokenness and humility, repenting of our sins. Indeed, you are faithful and just. You forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank you for that amazing, amazing mercy in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. My paper will escape me, so I'm making sure it's secure. So like I said, I, I'm going into my second year of Bible college. I'll be returning for another uh, two semesters. And I just have something I would like to share with you uh, that I've been learning throughout my first year. Um, so I'll start with my, my favorite Psalm, which is Psalm 146, verses five and six, which says, blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. I think it 
illustrates well um, a truth that God's been teaching me. Um, and I've been learning to remember the mighty acts of God, remembering both God's work in Scripture and his care and provision in my own life. In my first semester of school, uh, we had a class called Pentateuch, so the first five books of the Bible. In those five books, there's a continuing theme of remembering how God has been faithful in the past so that one might have faith that he will continue to be faithful in the future. God, many times, especially in Genesis, uses the phrase, um, I am the God of your fathers. Um, he'll refer to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And this title is, is one he gives himself um, that is meant to turn our focus on his salvation in the past and to remember what he's done. He's calling us to, to look at, um, at his action in our lives, as, uh, at his involvement. And this is, this is something that God has been impressing on me, uh, so that, I, that I might remember what he's done, how he's cared for me as I've been growing up. Um, I'm only 20, but God has done amazing things in that, in that 20 years. I've seen him answer prayers that I've forgotten I've even prayed. His word teaches me of his great care for his people in the Old Testament, the Israelites. And that I can know that that God of the Old Testament is the same God that rules my life today. Uh, he will be faithful to me for the rest of my life and to my children after me and to their children after them. He will never disappear. He will never leave. Um, another passage of mine, uh, a favorite from Joshua, is uh, Joshua 4, 21 through 24, which happens after Joshua set up a memorial, after God parted the, the Jordan River for Israel. So I'll, I'll read it here to close my testimony. It says, And he said to the people of Israel, When your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know, Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan until you had passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we had passed over. So, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Um, and here, the elders are being instructed to tell those after them of what God has done and what God has done even before that. Um, and it's important for us to remember those things and to make sure we are keeping the gospel and God's promises in our life daily and then also passing them on to others. Um, because we do have a very sure God and a faithful God, and he will never, ever leave us. Thank you. <clears throat> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be able to come to you right now. We ask that you would guide our conversation, Lord, that as we look at your word, our hearts would be penetrated, um, would be impacted and Lord, we ask that this not only be an academic process, but something that is substantially altering in our behavior. Lord, we don't want to just know more when we're done. We want to be different and transformed after this time with you. And so we look forward to your moving in our lives. In your name, amen. Amen. We began a series last week on the I Am statements of Jesus. We began last week looking at Jesus' statement of before Abraham was, I am. And uh, the reaction that that brought about in the attitudes, the minds, the actions of a lot of people. They knew what that meant because remember, going back to Genesis, when God introduced himself to Abraham and said, uh, I'm not Abraham, uh, uh, Moses going down to Egypt saying, who should I say sent me? I am. And that's always been his name. We've understood that to be his name. So when Jesus came to the people and he made that statement, I am, and he consistently did in the different situations that we're going to look at, they understood what that meant, his claim to deity. So using last week as a springboard, we're going to move on now to the first of his I am statements, other than the before Abraham was, I am. And we see the first one in John chapter 6. 
The gospel often shows Jesus instructing people as to his true identity and purpose. But sadly, the masses usual response was doubt and ridicule. However, few passages show Jesus working harder and his listeners being more self-serving than in the scripture that we're going to be looking at today. Now, in order to get a kind of a running start, we need to go back in chapter six, see what was going on before we get to Jesus' statement of I am the bread. Just prior to our lesson, the entire countryside had been covered with literally thousands. Some estimate as high as 15, 20,000. We're told 5,000 men and then women and children. So you've got entire families that are there. If you were to look at your family, some of you I know come from multiple siblings and, and I have three brothers and some of you come from smaller families. You average that all out and you've probably got about 15 to 20,000 people. So the miracle was not only the feeding of 5,000 guys, but their families as well. And we need to keep that in mind. Uh, verse 14, therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. If you saw something like that, where God moves in such a way through a person, wouldn't that get your attention? You would begin to go, hmm, there's something pretty special about this guy. And the people reacted that way. They recognized in Jesus something going on that was out of the ordinary, or to use our vernacular, out of the box. Jesus was acting and thinking, teaching outside of the box of normalcy, even for that day and age. We would get our attention today, but it got their attention back then as well. It's exciting to read the biblical passages when the people seem to actually catch on. The crowd was undoubtedly impressed. This was quite a stunt. But did they really understand him to be the Messiah, the Redeemer of God? Or were they just recognizing Jesus as the next Elijah or Elisha? After all, there were quite a number of prophets who had preceded uh, over the years, over the centuries, prophets who had done miraculous things, the Elijahs and the Elishas and others who had amazed the people of their time by their deeds and, and by their uh, God-initiated miracles. Um, let's face it, Elijah with fire from heaven, that's going to get your attention, right? Yeah, and there are a number of those kinds of situations. Uh, through Moses, where you have manna, uh, which we'll see here in a little bit, uh, you have the parting of the Red Sea, you have the water from the rock, uh, all kinds of things that God did through the early prophets and messengers. So was he really God, or was he just the next in a long line of significant miracle workers? Now, Jesus is not pulling any punches. He's, he's making it very clear for them, but the people are just not processing all this. It's kind of tough for them, especially after all these years of silence. Remember, how many years of silence was there since the last Old Testament prophet? 400 years. Yeah, so it's going to be a little tough for them to process all this, but Jesus is making it as clear as he can. In verse 15, so Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force, to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. And here is the point where we see the depth of Israel's denseness. You might say, that sounds pretty good. You know, making him king, that's a pretty smart move. But what was their motivation? It wasn't making him a spiritual king or recognizing his divinity. They're figuring, hey, we got a pretty good deal here. This guy works miracles, he heals, and he can fill our belly besides. We'll never lack for food this way. We need a king like this. Jesus understood their heart. He understood their motivation, and he wanted none of it. Because it was never about material gain. It was never about material authority. It was always about the spiritual reality and the spiritual kingdom of God's kingdom. And, and the people weren't getting it. Jesus is right to disappear into the mountain. After all, it's not much longer before we see the mob chasing after him. A little bit later, just a few verses down, verse 22 and following. The next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw there were, was no other small boat there except one. And that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. 
So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now there's a significant event that happens in the middle of this, and that's Jesus walking on the water. All the people saw was that he had left one area and he must have gone someplace else. They're trying to figure out where he went because the disciples left without him. So Jesus must have gone somewhere. Do you think in their imaginations they thought, oh, he walked to the other side? No, this was not on their radar at all. All they knew is that somehow he got from where he had been to maybe being on the other side. It had not, I'm sure, entered their imaginations on how he got there. That's a story for another time, a sermon for another time. They scoured the countryside to no avail. They checked out the lakeshore and found no sign of Jesus nor his disciples. The crowd figured they must have gone across to Capernaum. So off they sailed. But they didn't know what the disciples had already experienced, that Jesus hadn't sailed to Capernaum, at least not all the way. He walked across most of the lake. Now the Bible tells us that it was a number of miles. He had walked a number of miles. Now I'm just curious, how many of you are walkers? Okay. How long does it take you to get uh, to cover a mile? 15 to 20 minutes, okay? Most of us average about three to three and a half miles an hour walking. Okay, so how long had Jesus been traipsing his way across the sea? Unless he was moving quicker than you and I, he would have been covering that territory at about three, three and a half miles an hour. He would have been walking on water for about an hour before he got to the disciples. Think about that for a second. This wasn't just walking off the shore about 100 yards. He had walked on the sea a significant period of time before he finally encountered the disciples. Now, a couple steps on top of the water, that's impressive. 20, 30 steps, hey, you got my attention. But I'm sorry, he couldn't have known the sandbars three to four miles into the sea which is unfortunately what some commentators have said. Well, the real miracle of Jesus was that he knew where all the sandbars were. No, no, that's not happening. Jesus walked on the water. And he got the disciples' attention. The people had no idea, really, what had happened to the disciples. All they knew is that he wasn't there. Jesus saw through their mixed emotions, but greater, excuse me, what greater king could they ask for than one who had the power to not only free Israel from Egypt, which was their ultimate desire, we gotta get out from underneath uh, Romans' tyranny. They could, this uh, leader could heal the sick and fill their bellies. Now, it's been known for years and years that people will elect who will promise them the most. In fact, the old adage, a chicken in every pot was part of an election. It's the economy stupid was part of an election. The whole issue that we're dealing with now as far as socialism, I promise, you know, the, what the 1% uh, owns, the, the rest of you will, will have all election motivation besides pushing agendas, but I mean, so you get the idea. This is not a new thing. The idea that I can be released from the tyranny of Rome, I can be healed of my afflictions, and I can have a full belly to boot. Who's gonna find a better king than that? And Jesus saw their motivation. It had nothing to do with spiritual realities. It had nothing to do with the idea of pursuing the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you, Matthew 6, 33. They wanted to guarantee a secure future. Jesus confronts this self-seeking and destructive attitude right at the start and we see that as we jump to verse 26 if you're following along. Jesus answered them and said, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. 
Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God, who has set, his, uh, excuse me, has set his seal. Jesus challenges their preconceptions and scolds their selfishness, and he urges them on to godliness all at once. He lays their motives bare before them. Now, if you were pursuing what you thought were righteous ends, hey, let's make this guy king, just think how much benefit we'll have uh, from his uh, authority and his rule, and then someone stands in front of you and basically says, you have this all wrong. That's basically what Jesus did. Again, pardon my paraphrase, you don't want me because of who I am, your savior, your redeemer, you're trying to, find, uh, trying to find me for what you hope to get from me. You want your bellies full. That's all. When people are pursuing the church or faith or relationship with God, oftentimes, and we use it in our evangelism. You, you saw it in the puppet sketch a little bit ago. How do you get somebody to BBS? Promise them a cookie. It's amazing how much you can manipulate somebody by utilizing their belly, their fleshly lusts, their desires. Just promise them something and they'll follow you. Doesn't even matter where you're going. Just promise them something significant, personal gain, security, a full belly. And it's amazing how far people will follow you. And Jesus goes, no, I don't want you to follow because you think you're going to get something out of this. Now, the bottom line is that we do, as Christians, we are promised in Scripture blessings beyond compare. But is our motivation, or should our motivation be for selfish gain? No, absolutely not. We come as servants. We come as, as, uh, uh, to sacrifice before the, the majesty of the king. But we do walk away with baskets full of blessing. How appropriate for our society today. What a fitting message for the Western Christian community and our culture as a whole. Churches are packed with thousands of consumer Christians Sunday after Sunday. Denominations have even been established, at least in part, on the premise that God is waiting to bless you. So come and get your share. You've probably heard that from any number of TV preachers and, and uh, radio broadcasters. God is just waiting for you to come. Demand your blessing. By the way, send me $50. I'm, I'm kidding. Don't send me $50. But that's part of the deal, part of the shtick. We have an entire generation of believers who have been drawn to the cross, not as an act of humility and brokenness, but as a means to an end, a smorgasbord of blessing. You want all of these things for your life? Okay, you've got to come to the cross, but look at all that you're going to get. And the cross is bypassed. It's simply a door to a truckload of blessing. And that's wrong. That's wrong. A general culture has been brainwashed into thinking that socialistic regimes are actually kinder and gentler to the masses. Just ask the people in Cuba and Venezuela how that's working. We've seen in the news the masses and the riots going on in Cuba. What are they screaming? They're screaming freedom. They're screaming liberty. The promises of socialism never panned out. A chicken in every pot? Nope, it doesn't work that way. And, and Jesus understood that. He understood that chasing him for personal gain was not the way to a fulfilled life. And so he ran away, and appropriately so. With this in mind, Jesus challenges their self-serving values with the words, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Do we run to Jesus? Absolutely. But is it for personal gain? No. But yet, 
He gives us all that we need and more. Times haven't changed that much. Like people today, the Israelites spent much of their energy and resource chasing after fleeting material things. Even in pursuing Jesus, their objectives were selfish and temporal. Um, just going to condense a quick story. Uh, it's interesting how your belly will get you to do inter- uh, pretty amazing things. There, when we lived in Missouri, there was a guy, he had been a chef. He was now a reti- semi-retired chef. He decided he didn't want to work so hard. He had worked in the highest class restaurants in St. Louis. And so he bought a house, revamped part of it into kind of a bar and, and the eatery kind of place, and decided he would be open when he wanted to be open. And it was called the chef's house. And it was at an intersection of a busy road, and uh, he just lived in the house, and every once in a while, when he felt like it, he would put a sign, a little A-frame sign, on the side of the road that said, open. Chef's house is open. And the, the phone lines would light up. People were calling everybody. The chef's house is open. Suddenly, cars filled this little parking lot. Because you never knew when that sign was going to be taken down. And so it would be open for two or three weeks at a time, and people would go and enjoy the amazing food that this guy would make, and then the sign would disappear, and the place was closed. He made a tidy living that way putting the sign up when he wanted to and taking the sign down when he felt like it. What I thought was so interesting is how people changed their itinerary. Everything was shut down because they had to get to the chef's chef's house. Ooh, Lord be with them. It was amazing how people would alter their entire schedule because that little A-frame sign was out on the corner of the parking lot. Meetings, no longer necessary. Ball games were moved around. All kinds of things. Because you didn't know how long that A-frame sign was going to be out. In contrast, Jesus reminds his listeners that what will truly satisfy, even into eternity, is a food of a different nature, a heavenly food given by the Son of Man. But this only seemed to spark further questions from the crowd. We see now in verses 28 through 29, Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in uh, him whom he has sent. Now, their question basically is the question that a lot of people are asking. How do I earn it? How do I work for it? Okay, God, you're telling me that there's more than material gain, that God wants something greater for us. So tell me how I earn it. Tell me what I have to do. You know, there's something in us that feels like we have to work for everything we get. You know, the old pull yourself up by your bootstraps is alive and well in America. And I understand a good work ethic is important. I was taught that since I was a little kid. Nothing comes free. You work for everything. But that's one thing about the gospel that really is counterintuitive. And that is that it's all been done for you. The thing you have to do is accept it, is, is submit to it. You say, Jesus, I understand you've done everything to pay for my sins, and I am so grateful. I come to you in faith. I lay my life at your feet. I am your servant. Now tell me what I have to do to earn this. Nothing. It's been done. The hard part is admitting that. And su- submitting to that reality. And so it must have really been hard for Jesus to hear this when the people responded the way they did. Jesus replies to their inquiry with his characteristic, honest simplicity. Believe in the one whom God has sent. 
When all is said and done, there truly is no more important work than maintaining one's walk with Christ. Martha, if you recall, struggled with this concept only to have Jesus correct her in front of her sister. You remember the story of Mary and Martha? Mary, wor- I mean, Martha working, working, working. Got to get all this done. Got to make everything right. The master is here. And Mary sitting at Jesus' feet. And what was Jesus' response? Martha, Martha. Mary's chosen the better part. It's not that the things didn't have to get done. It's not that the people didn't have to get fed and all that. But there's a time and a place. And the greater part in that moment is what Mary understood and she was going to sit and listen because she didn't know how long the, ma- the chef's house sign was going to be out. She didn't know how long the master was going to be with them and she wasn't going to compromise a moment of that because spiritual food was greater than physical food and she understood that. I've got a quote there for you, but I'm going to move beyond that for the sake of time. There's no greater work we can perform for our Heavenly Father than to live lives of faithful service to His Son, Jesus Christ. But sadly, Jesus' followers are still struggling to get to this critical starting point. They had experienced Jesus' miraculous feeding of the multitude and had heard the news of His unorthodox journey across the sea. Who could have imagined He'd walk most of the way? But they'd heard it, I'm sure. As they were waiting on the other side of the sea, and the disciples came with Jesus, I'm sure the story spread like wildfire. But, instead of believing, you'd think that that would be enough. But instead, we see in verse 30, So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign, so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Now, he'd fed thousands. He'd walked across most of the the sea. And now they had the audacity to ask, show us a sign. Show us a sign. And they referred back to a situation in their distant past where God had worked through Moses. And it's the situation with the manna. Now, why would they have established Moses' miracle as greater than Jesus' miracle? How long did the manna come? Every day? For years. How, how, much, how, long, <laughs> how long did Jesus' miracle last? One. One incident. He fed thousands, but Moses fed thousands. Jesus did it one day. Moses did it for years. Now, the problem is, who actually did the miracle? Did Moses do the miracle? No, Moses was simply the mouthpiece. God worked the miracle. The same one that worked the miracle of the manna is the same one who worked the miracle of feeding the thousands. Except Jesus was God, and that was the difference. And they didn't see it. They didn't understand it. They're wanting Jesus to somehow compete with Moses. And they didn't get the fact that God was the ultimate miracle giver. Jesus was challenging them to believe in him as the very Son of God, their long-awaited Messiah. And in their minds, this would take a much greater sign than the one-time feeding of a few thousand. After all, Moses, their most powerful prophet and patriarch, fed millions of Israelites for years. And so we continue on, verse 32. Jesus says to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. What's the problem? Again, it's a full belly. It's all about themselves. Now granted, there was a woman at a well who made kind of a similar statement when Jesus said, you know, if you'd have asked, I'd have given you water to drink that would have taken you for all eternity. And she kind of was interested in that. I I wish I didn't have to draw at this well all the time. 
It would sure be a lot easier in life not to have to come every day. I'd save a whole lot of embarrassment. So give me this water and, and let it satisfy me, not understanding that Jesus was talking about a different kind of refreshing. And he's doing the same thing here with these people. They're wanting something materially to fill their bellies, thinking that that satisfaction and that contentment that comes with a full belly. You know, think about the last time you had a really satisfying meal and you sat back and you just kind of, ah, that's really nice. I'm not talking about eating to the point of discomfort, but contentment. Wouldn't it be nice to feel that way all the time? And Jesus goes, you have completely missed the boat. You can feel that way all the time, spiritually. I'm not talking about physical food. And the people didn't get it. Jesus gently challenges his listeners to rethink their assess assessment of the facts of history. For centuries, the people had held Moses in the highest regard for the wonders performed by his hands. However, Jesus reminds them that it wasn't by Moses that wonders were performed, but by the power and the will of God. Jesus tells the people that they need to look beyond Moses' bread. After all, the bread of the desert, manna, was temporal and short-lived in its benefit. By the way, how long did it last? One day. What happened if they tried to keep it to the next? Yeah, there's a spiritual lesson in that too. Just because you had a good spiritual meal with Jesus one day doesn't mean that that lasts you for months. You need to, you need to eat. You need to spend time with him every day. <clears throat> so in their stupor, they asked that Jesus always give them this bread completely missing the eternal aspect of Jesus' teaching. Just as the Israelites expected manna forever, and the woman at the well requested water that would forever quench her thirst, these faint-hearted followers requested a bread that forever satisfies. To which Jesus answers in similar fashion, we see in verse 35, and this is the kind of the crux of the whole thing. He looks them in the eye and he goes, I am the bread of life. Do you think that I am was missed on them? No, they understood exactly what that meant. Remember this, co this correlation between manna coming from heaven and all that stuff, and then he has the audacity to say, I am the bread of life. You want real bread? You want to be satisfied? You want contentment beyond compare? You want to know what it's like to have nourishment that lasts you to eternal life? Then you have to look to me. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. God's gifts do provide a level of human contentment, but only in Jesus Christ can the deepest cravings of our lives be fulfilled. It's a contentment that is both um, eternal and complete. There's no need to search for the next great religious fountain or spiritual feeding trough. The bread provided in Christ permeates every fiber of our being and completely nourishes every cell in our bodies. At least it should. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. And we see in the next verses really how dense this group was. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who believes or beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Jesus admits, you know, I, I can do all these things in front of you. My Father may, may work a number of works, but there are going to be those who just don't get it. There are going to be those who don't receive it, who don't believe it. And that must have been so hard because he came, as we heard in John 3.16, came for the sins of the world. He paid the price for the sins of the world. But most would not recognize it. But for those who do, the promise is enduring. The promise is eternal life. But the sad reality is that most won't. 
It's sad but true that many who come face to face with Christ will refuse him. They may acknowledge him as a great philanthropist, a moralist, or a teacher. They may even admit that God worked through him, nodding to his miracles. However, accepting Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior of all creation, requires another level of faith. Herein lies the difficult truth of Scripture. Though Jesus loves and died for the sins of the whole world, not all will, re will receive him. But for those who do, Jesus promises to protect and keep them, ultimately raising them to eternal life on the last day. For the Father has willed it, and the Son will not fail. It must have broken Jesus' heart to see this truth played out as the next several passages unfold. I'm going to jump down as I close. Verse 48 and then 50 and 51. I am the bread of life. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, in our Lutheran tradition, we do not hold to what some have termed eternal security. Once saved, always saved. We do believe in this thing called apostasy, that you can make a choice and walk away. We understand that. But in our desire to be accurate, as far as that goes, we sometimes fail to emphasize the truth of what is said here in this passage. If you have a relationship with Jesus, one of the promises of walking in that relationship is eternal life, and you don't have to be afraid of that. You don't have to wonder about that. Jesus wrote, I write these things that you may know. That you may know. And so saints, when the enemy comes and he whispers in your ear, you're just working on borrowed time. How can you trust God? You point to these types of passages. You point to Romans 8, the end. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then a whole list of things that cannot separate you. If you stand in relationship with Jesus, if you walk daily in relationship with him, there is nothing the enemy can throw at you that will rob you of the promise of eternal life. And when you participate, you know, we talk about communion and all of that, participate in the body and blood of Christ. When you allow his, the bread of Christ, to nourish you, there is nothing that will rob you of the promise that comes with that. And it's amazing that Jesus goes to such extent to try to help them understand. The bread of this world is fleeting. The nourishment lasts only a little while. The manna would fade and turn to worms. But to allow the nourishment of Christ to so join with us as we abide in him there is nothing that can take the benefit and promise of that away ever ever let's pray dear heavenly father i thank you that indeed the promises the realities of eternal life with you are so uniquely tied together to our walking in relationship with you Lord, we don't want the material benefits of this world. We don't want the bread that is consumed today and wears off in its benefit. We want the bread of you, of your flesh, of a relationship with you. We want to know the contentment that only comes through a relationship with you. And Lord, we stand in that confidence. Your word is so clear that as we walk with you and abide with you, one of the benefits of that bread, the bread of your life, works in us through all eternity. We thank you, Lord. In your name, amen. Amen.